Hello and welcome to our webinar, Contextual Guidance at Intersections for Protected Bicycle Lanes. My name is Brendan Williams. I am the Research Program Administrator at Portland State University's Transportation Research and Education Center. TREK leads the National Institute for Transportation and Communities, one of seven national university transportation centers funded by the U.S. Department of Transportation. NITSI consortium members are the University of Arizona, University of Oregon, University of Utah, University of Texas at Arlington, and Oregon Institute of Technology. NITSI's research priority is improving mobility of people and goods to build strong communities. Our webinars on the latest NITSI-funded projects feature faculty, researchers, and students. It is our goal to provide you with usable research results. We appreciate your feedback. Our speakers today are Christopher Monsier and Nathan McNeil. Chris is a professor and chair of civil and environmental engineering in the Massey College of Engineering and Computer Science at Portland State University. His primary research interests are in design and operation of multimodal transportation facilities, including user behavior, comprehension, preferences, and the overall safety effectiveness of transportation improvements. Nathan is a research associate at the Center for Urban Studies at Portland State University. He conducts research around impacts of new bicycle infrastructure and programs on travel behavior and attitudes towards cycling, shared use mobility pro programs, including car sharing and bike share, and the connection between land use and transportation. Our upcoming events include two Friday transportation seminars. This Friday, October 11th, Offer Grembeck from the Safe Transportation Research and Education Center will be presenting on the safe system approach, considerations for developing a multi-layered system. On October 18th, Dr. David Berrigan, biologist at the National Cancer Institute, will be presenting on physical activity in the built environment. Our Friday transportation seminars are recorded and available to watch online. We also have our annual Ann Niles Active Transportation Luncheon on October 15th on PSU's campus, featuring Angie Schmidt, formerly of Streets Blog USA. She will present on the pedestrian safety crisis in America, why it's happening, and what we can do about it. Okay, a brief overview of our webinar. Chris and Nathan will present for about 40 minutes. During their presentation, please submit your questions via the GoToWebinar control panel. We will have about 15 minutes after their presentation to answer as many of, the, of your questions as we can. We are recording today's webinar and we'll make it available on our website. You will receive an email with a link to the video recording and presentation slides. If you are tracking professional development hours, this webinar is eligible for one hour of continuing education credit. Instructions on how to redeem the credit will be included in your post-webinar email. With that, I will hand it over to Chris and Nathan. Okay, thanks, Brendan. Um, uh, my name is Chris Monsier, and uh, thanks everybody for taking time out of your day to uh, attend this webinar and learn about it, this research. Um, we've got a lot to show, so let's get started. So, the outline for today um, is we're gonna we're gonna go over the the background and our overall research approach. We'll talk to you about the two key uh, inputs to the research: um, uh, an in-person uh, survey of perceived comfort of uh, bicycling through various intersection designs, some work we did to 
uh, explore uh, conflicts as they vary by volume and simulations, and then our resulting uh, guidance and wrap up with conclusions. Um, <clears throat> just a quick note on the final report, we're in the last phases of a addressing the technical review panel's peer review comments. Um, they had some great suggestions on some final edits to the report, and it'll be published by uh, NITSI uh, very soon. Um, but just with the caveat that um, some minor changes to the material presented here are possible. Um, so just uh, as a preview of what we're going to show you, the key takeaways for this research is that um, we have developed estimates of perceived comfort of persons bicycling um, through various intersections designs for protected or separated bikeways. Um, not surprisingly, the, the, the key variables um, that emerged are what you might expect, is that uh, people's preference for separation in time or space um, and uh, minimizing the distance that they are exposed or mixing to traffic are key drivers of comfort. Um, of the designs we explored, which I'll go over in much more detail in a few slides, um, the bend out or offset or protected intersection um, and fully signalized designs provide the most comfort to the most people. Um, you'll see that we did not really, we did not explore the the safety in terms of actual crashes or, or actual conflicts in this research. Um, we uh, intentionally focused on the, the comfort question uh, first. Uh, but there is some uh, recent guidance or recent re results from uh, New York uh, City DOT. Um, there's a link, there's a, uh, the end of the slides, I've uh, got a, a screen capture of what the that report is, but cycling at at the crossroads um, has some great um, safety related information uh, similar to these designs that we've explored. Okay, so the background. Um, I think the, the research shows um, from a variety of researchers that uh, there's a strong preference for potential for cyclists and potential cyclist for the physical separation for on streets, uh, on street bike lanes. Um, in general, um, these uh, bikeways um, with separation from traffic are associated with uh, increased safety. Uh, at the segment level, most of the research is focused on the segment level, but, but intersections are the weak link. And there's two sort of things to explore um, related to the design options at intersections. One is the safety, uh, which obviously is a key um, consideration and design selection. But the second is also this perceived comfort, because um, we know from, from other research that um, people's perception of comfort um, is a key decision-making variable on whether or not they will bicycle for transportation, particularly for those that are most uh, sensitive to traffic. And so um, <clears throat> with that in mind, um, and we spent a lot of time um, with the team, um, which included, uh, which I forgot to mention on the first slide, um, included Nathan and I, um, a PhD student here, Yi Wang, and then the, um, the team at Tool Design, Rebecca Sanders, Rob Birchfield, uh, and Bill Schulteis. Um, so our research overview, um, as I mentioned, those two data inputs, um, an in-person survey and some micro simulation models uh, calibrated by some uh, video observation of these designs in the field. Um, out of the in-person survey, we derived uh, comfort by design and whether or not people interacted with vehicles. From the simulation, we estimated the expected number of conflicts um, by the different design types uh, and uh, varied by the volume of vehicles. Um, we merge these two things together to get an estimate of comfort thresholds um, based on the design selected and the volume of uh, right turning vehicles and through bicycles. So we did have to limit the scope. Um, we limited it to one-way configurations, although it's clear that um, two-way configurations uh, need special focus. Um, 
We also uh, focused on the right turning interaction between uh, bicycles and vehicles. Um, seems to drive most of the design decision because that's where most of the movements is. This does not, um, you know, neglect the idea that there is conflicts with left turning traffic um, and there are potentially conflicts with pedestrian volumes, but those are two variables that we did not have the sort of scope and time or budget to explore. So the designs we evaluated as we were thinking about things, we sort of grouped the designs into two basic, uh, two general categories. Um, either you maintain the separation of the protected or separated bikeway all the way to the intersection, um, or um, prior to the intersection, you mix um, bicycles and vehicles um, in some way um, before they approach. Um, and we got lots of pictures here to sort of make sure um, it's clear uh, what we're talking about. So uh, these these uh, images are from the FHWA separated bike line, separated bike lane planning and design guide. Um, um, the, the first option, obviously, the first option is the is the bend in where um, the protected, um, you know, uh, the protected uh, bikeway, um, you know, bends in um, to uh, be adjacent to right turning traffic. Um, this is where the right turning traffic is. Um, the um, Second option then is to is, is to is to bend out that bikeway design, um, and when we were focusing on um, you know focusing on this interaction between uh, bikes and cars, um, we initially had hoped to sort of be able to explore the effect of this offset distance um, on the comfort and placement um, on the comfort of the cyclist uh, and other. Uh, parameters. Um, we didn't get to explore that in, in as much detail as we would have liked, but from our perspective, focusing just on this quadrant, uh, the bend out design, and you'll see the protected intersection um, are, are similar in sort of their expected sort of um, interactions. Um, a bike signal is obviously another option where you can fully separate um, the, the turning traffic from the through bicycle movements, um, and we did explore that. Um, the options to, to mix, and there are lots of varieties here on this mixing zone design, but this basically requires um, the separation, the protected, the protected or separation ends, um, and then bikes and cars uh, need to mix in shared space. Um, and the last design is this lateral shift um, where the protector separated bike lane um, slides over um, and then there's a there's a conflict area between uh, vehicles and through bikes um, in advance of the intersection. So let's talk about how we developed this uh, survey instrument and you'll see some samples of the various video clips. Um, so in terms of our data collection, uh, we looked and searched around for cities that had uh, uh, variations on many of these designs. And so we could go um, in sort of one trip and collect lots of options. Uh, we ended up collecting data from primarily West Coast cities, Denver, Portland, Salt Lake City, and Seattle. Um, and we uh, took much more video, but um, in the final, clips um, there are 10 locations. So the video is first person. Um, we collected it and uh, curated these interactions with uh, with vehicles so that they were um, as similar across the designs as possible. We had lots of lots of footage. Um, I sort of felt like a movie maker at some points as we were um, Nathan and I were collecting um, and and editing all these different videos. Um, but here are the different design types. This table shows the locations and the street intersections. So there's some photos coming up um, and the different types. Um, we also measured um, some geometric characteristics, um, one uh, being how far the bend is, um, the other being the, 
the mix merge distance. So how um, how long is that mixing emerging zone between bikes and cars? And then a variable we call the exposure distance, which is the end of the protection on the far side of the intersection to the um, resumption of the protection on the far side of the intersection. So, um, so that was what we categorized as the exposure distance. And the report has more details on some of the other um, geometric characteristics we looked at. So just to give you some photos, since this will, this will be important as you sort of um, try and think about how you might apply the research results. Um, mixing zones, we had some variation on this, um, um, on the top one as in Salt Lake City was sort of a short mixing zone where the mixing zone distance isn't very, isn't very long. Um, the bottom one is in Portland with a relatively long uh, mixing zone. Um, the one on the top here is a mixing zone in Seattle that has some uh, post uh, limited entry, post protected uh, entry that sort of ensures that the vehicles enter the mixing zone at that point and not earlier. Um, we did include a bike signal um, in this is in Denver, um, but in order to show this video, we needed to do some animations. Um, and so the video paused and people were able to comprehend um, that there was a bike signal and that the vehicles were controlled by a separate signal phase. And then in the clip, we had a vehicle that was waiting to turn as the, as the bicycle proceeded through the intersection. So um, all the other clips are, as you'll see in the samples were, were in motion, but that one we had to do a little stop animation to, to annotate it. And then these two lateral shifts, one in Denver and one in Seattle, where the, where the protected bike lane or separated bike lane um, shifts shifts in and merges and there's 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 varieties or variations on these on these two designs um, the the bend in design um, again uh, one in Salt Lake City um, and then um, one in um, Denver um, so this is where the bike lane bends back in um, to the interact to um, adjacent to the through vehicle traffic the protected intersection, which we equi equivalented, uh, had equivalent, and we use the term sort of interchangeably in our results here, sort of um, as the bend out design. At the time, this was really the only intersection um, uh, that we could use. It's the it's the intersection at the in Salt Lake City. Um, it's very large, uh, very large intersection, and a uh, a very large sort of offset distance, um, but this was the protected intersection used in the clips. And then the last, the last, um, the last uh, type is this, uh, what we call the no bend, um, where uh, the protection is carried all the way up to the intersection, but there's no, there's no bend. So it's, but there is a sort of offset distance from the vehicle lane. We did have two controls uh, that we, that we included. One was a, or, uh, actually, we had another control as well uh, on street bike lane, but we we measured this to compare to some earlier work that uh, um, that Nick Foster had done um, evaluating the level of service for protected bike lane segments. And so these we showed these clips as well. Um, and just note that that rating, that comfort rating, is out of five, and both the trail and the protected bike lane segment have this have essentially um, very high comfort rating scores. Um, so let's let's look at a at a clip. Um, we curated the clips to kind of have two uh, two types. Um, and of course, it's not going to work uh, on the webinar. Mm. Sorry, hold on a second. So 
So there's an example of a clip where um, the, the, that you interacted um, with a vehicle. Um, this is the second types of clips. Um, I don't have the, I think we left the YouTube video off for this one, um, so I'm not gonna get it to play. Um, but this one um, is where the cyclist, the perceived first person cyclist, um, sees a vehicle turn in front of them, but they don't interact with the vehicle. So the clips were shown for both um, interacting with the vehicle and um, just seeing a vehicle turning ahead of you, but not interacting it. Um, we were careful sort of about the, the, that the interactions were as close to comparable across all the designs as possible. Um, you know, mostly cars or sort of smaller uh, uh, SUVs or uh, or in this case, uh, a truck that was in in the in the screen. Um, we edited the playback speed so the speeds of the cyclist approaching the intersection um, were similar. So we tried to do as much as we could about the perception of the clips um, as possible. So um, the in-person survey, um, we uh, uh, these were all uh, in rooms where we had control of the screen and sound. Um, and so folks uh, were recruited with a $5 uh, gift card to some uh, nearby establishment to take a transportation survey. They could join the, the clips played on a continuous loop. They could join at any time. And then they were basically asked to score these clips on a comfort scale from one to five. Um, and then a number of clips they were asked on a sort of a third question about would they ride there um, with uh, a 10 year old child. Um, the surveys were done in uh, Portland, Oregon, um, and in Woodburn, Oregon, which is a, a small, mostly rural community south of Portland here, then in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and Tacoma Park, Maryland. Um, we had 277 individuals rating the 26, 26 clips, so we have about 7,166 ratings of all of these different clips. Um, the survey was, um, um, this is the pooled results, which we did most of the analysis for. So I just want to give you a sense of sort of, you know, what was the demographic makeup of the pooled survey, fairly good gender split, age representation, and a, um, and a reasonable sort of uh, 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 racial distribution in the, in the survey. Um, the report does have analysis of the survey results by lots of these different variables, but we won't show them uh, today. Um, but importantly, this survey had a good uh, mix of people who, um, uh, who drive, who take transit, um, who bike, who use most modes. Um, only 36% of the sample um, had their uh, most recently biked for transportation within the last month. Um, uh, over half the sample um, hadn't biked for transportation in five years, uh, more five, more than five years or never. Um, most people had a driver's license, a working car, a transit pass, and um, only 60% had a car truck, which is, a, you know, some, um, um, which is, you know, just to keep in mind, I think, in terms of what, what are the demographics of what's in the survey. But, um, so there are there are some limitations on the you know the recruitment and the sample size is it's not a random sample so people have some selection bias when they elect to take these uh, surveys. Um, in general, there was a higher educational attainment uh, folks in the survey um, than the U.S. as a whole. Um, they were less likely to have kids in the household than the survey as a whole, and there were some differences. Um, locally between the location and the sample demographics. So some locations had um, were, were, were older and less racially diverse than the general population around the sample. Um, but we did in the end uh, pool these uh, survey results and the rest of the analysis in our, in our modeling um, location was not a statistically significant um, variable in the prediction of comfort. Um, and so if we feel uh, pooling the results is, uh, is uh, reasonable for analysis. So I'm going to turn it over to Nathan, who uh, is going to talk about the survey results.
Great, thanks, Chris. Um, so to move into the survey results, I'm going to try to control the screen here. Uh, there we go. Um, so first, we wanted to look at some of the individual characteristics and how they might affect the, the perceived comfort that we saw uh, across all of the different intersections that we looked at. Um, and so as you can see here, um, just the, the bars on the, uh, across there have the comfort, uh, either very or somewhat comfortable on the left in green, and then moving over to somewhat or very uncomfortable on the right in red. Um, so right off the bat, you can see that uh, men in general were, were had higher comfort ratings across the you know, across the different intersections um, and control locations, uh, and and white respondents also had a higher level of comfort. We also found that uh, it's, while not shown here, uh, respondents over 55 years of age had lower comfort ratings on average. Um, these differences did. Uh, carry out, uh, carry through across the the ratings, and so it's just something to keep in mind that there are individual differences. Um, I'm going to hold off on those until I get a little bit later in some of the results, um, but we will come back to this a little bit. Um, but just something to keep in mind. So as we move into uh, some of the differences between the different intersection types. Um, so these ratings are, you know, as you can see here, character, character, uh, categorized by the different intersection designs. Um, and one thing to keep in mind are the controls that Chris showed earlier, which were, um, these are all on a rating scale of one being very uncomfortable and five being very comfortable. Um, the off-street trails uh, had a 4.77, so you can see that's higher than anything that we had in the intersections. Um, the protected bike lane segment had a rating of 4.54 on average, so again, higher than anything you'll see here. Um, the standard bike lane, which was on a, about a 35-mile-an-hour three-lane road, had a rating of about 2.79, so um, lower than, than what you see here uh, for the most part. And um, and those are consistent with some of the ratings that past uh, you know past studies using this methodology have found. Um, and so just to get into the the different intersection designs, the signalized and protected uh, intersections uh, had the highest overall mean comfort scores and were rated as comfortable by about two thirds of the respondents. Uh, the bicycle signal. Um, as you can see, is a 67% rated to comfortable. Um, the bend in and maintain separation designs had a, a, were rated as comfortable by about half of the respondents on average. Um, and then the mixing zones and lateral shift designs were rated uh, as the least comfortable of the different design types, somewhere around uh, a third to 40% uh, rating them as comfortable. Um, there, you can see there that we do distinguish between uh, location or between clips that had a turning, an interaction with a turning vehicle and clips that didn't show that kind of an interaction. So looking at the difference in the ratings between uh, those two situations, um, the most significant drop between, uh, between, an inter between a clip without an interaction and one with were for the maintain separation and bend in designs. Um, the protected intersection design only dropped by about 9%, with 63% reporting they would still be comfortable even with the presence of turning vehicles. Um, and then interestingly, the mixing zone locations saw no difference in the percentage of respondents uh, indicating that they would be comfortable uh, with or without an, inter an interaction. Um, I think the biggest thing to take away from this is that those the bend in and the maintain separation show the the greatest uh, you know sensitivity to the presence of a turning vehicle, um, and part of the reason perhaps why the mixing zone and lateral shift don't show as big of a difference may be because the design uh, suggests the presence of a vehicle already, and so people are sort of primed regardless to expect that. Um, moving on. Um, or trying to, let's see. Chris, I seem to have lost the power uh, to move it. I don't know if you can go to the next slide. Okay, I did, I did yeah. Um, so uh, we, we did a number of regression models uh, to look at the effect of various design level uh, variables and other individual variables on comfort scores. Um, and, and I guess, you know, we tried to control for these uh, person level uh, variation um, and particularly some of the demographic differences that I highlighted at the beginning. Uh, so exposure distance did emerge as a key significant uh, design factor in the ratings. 
Um, this figure shows the average percentage of respondents indicating that they would either be somewhat or very comfortable uh, riding through that location compared to the distance the rider would be exposed. So from the loss of protection where the separated bike lane ends uh, to where the protection picks up on the far side of the street. Um, and so, you know, just looking, just, and this, this example is uncontrolled for other factors, but there's a very clear trend where the longer exposure distances uh, are equated with less comfort. Um, and that did, you know, again, when taking into account other factors, that remained a strong and important uh, difference. Um, and we, let's see, so Chris, could you move ahead? Um, we also wanted to look at some of the factors that may play into the, the idea of whether a design is you know, kind of an all ages and abilities type design. And, and one of the ways that we did that was to ask for a select number of clips. Uh, we, we asked the, the respondents to view it for a third time and decide yes or no, would you consider riding at this location with a 10 year old child? And so it's a pretty straightforward, it's, it's not on a rating scale, it's just a simple yes or no. We did include uh, the, on the left there, the 89% is the, uh, the protected bike lane segment, so not an intersection location. And we had 89%, uh, so really high per, uh, percentage of people saying they would ride there with a child. Um, next were the bend in and protected intersection designs at around 70 to 68% followed by the maintained separation. So that was the one where the, the, the bike lane goes straight, but there's separation up to the intersection. And then finally around uh, under a third or a quarter of uh, respondents said they would ride at either the lateral shift or the, or the short mixing zone type design um, with a child. And it's worth noting all of these clips, we, we specifically asked this question for clips where there was not an interaction with a vehicle. So it was just, you know, there was, they understood that there could be, but, um, in the clip that we showed, it was you know, just them, just the bicyclist riding through the intersection. Um, and we also wanted to get, uh, provide an opportunity to, have people uh, identify uh, some preferences for different facilities uh, in comparison and provide some uh, open-ended feedback as to why they preferred one design over another. So we presented two pairs of intersections that they had viewed. And this, so this was after they had viewed all of the clips. Uh, we asked them to, to do this extra portion of the survey. Um, and they first rated, uh, looked at this pair A and B, and then a second pair C and D, and then we asked them to compare the four. So I'll go through um, both of those. But so on this first pair, um, the, on the left is a mixing zone design uh, on Multnomah Street in Portland. On the right is a lateral shift design on Northeast, on Roosevelt Northeast in Seattle. Um, so on the left, 39% told us that they would prefer to ride through that mixing zone design. Um, of those, you can see that the yield sign and markings were one factor. A lot of people also felt that with this, this design, they could remain kind of curb tight, stay to the right, that they wouldn't have to cross uh, traffic and, and kind of, you know, interact as much with turning vehicles. 61% um, chose the design on the right. Uh, with a lot of them indicating that they, they liked the separation where there were clear markings between the bicycle space and the and the car space. Um, and so kind of just the sense that um, they knew where they should be and they, they felt safer kind of having those spaces uh, designated on the street. The second pairing was a uh, the protected intersection design in Salt Lake, that bend out design on the left. And then a bend in design, uh, the one on the right, which is in Denver on 14th uh, Avenue. Is that, uh, yeah. Uh, and so, not surprisingly, given the comfort ratings that I showed just before, um, the protected intersection design was favored by a lot. 83% uh, uh, preferred that design. Um, a lot of them uh, spoke about when, when writing why they liked it, it was the, the curb separation, the, the protection from vehicles. A lot of people also talked about how the design impacted the behavior of, of motorists and cyclists at this location. So indicating that, um, you know, that there would be improved visibility, that cars would have to slow down, that there was room to react. And so that was interesting to see the kind of the going from just the, what was in the picture to kind of extrapolating how how uh, users would react to it. 
of the 17% that preferred the design on the right, um, for many it was viewed as a less confusing design and they felt there was better visibility and alertness. Um, looking at all four designs, so then we asked them of the preferences to A and B and the preferences to C and D, of the four, which would they prefer? Uh, not surprisingly, the protected intersection design, uh, that bend out design was uh, the most popular, chosen by 73%, followed by the bend in design and the lateral shift. Uh, we, about 6% uh, selected the mixing zone as the one they would prefer. Um, so I also I mentioned before that I wanted to have a little bit of time to discuss um, some of the individual differences and how those factors play into these preference ratings. So we didn't have enough information in our survey to get at um, the, the typical four types of cyclists that is similar to what Roger Geller proposed, which would include the strong and fearless, enthused and uh, confident, interested but concerned, and no way, no how. But we did have some uh, attitude and perception questions about bicycling that we were able to do a cluster analysis on to kind of pull out a few different groups um, that had pretty different uh, views towards cycling and experiences with cycling. Um, so the first group, as you can see on the screen there, was the bike inclined group, and these are the names that we gave them. Um, this, this group tended to feel that destinations were within bike bikeable distances. They didn't feel deterred by traffic. They did see people like them riding in their neighborhood, and they also, amongst the groups, were the most likely to be biking for transportation. Um, they also happened to be more, they were more likely to be white and more likely to be men. Uh, the second group was similar enough to uh, the interested but concerned group in that four types uh, typology that I mentioned, that we, we use that uh, name as well. And uh, they were interested in biking more almost universally. Uh, they almost universally felt that traffic kept them from biking more and, uh, and they were more likely to be women. And then finally, we had a third group, which we called the indifferent to bicycling. Um, they were less interested in bicycling generally, although not uninterested, um, but they also didn't feel like destinations were bikeable. They don't see people like them riding in their neighborhood. Um, they're most likely to take trips by car and least likely to uh, have a transit pass or to, to bike for transport. Um, we also noted in looking at the area, uh, the zip codes of where the different people live, that these uh, these respondents were least likely to live in denser areas. So they, they lived in less dense areas. So when I say indifferent to bicycling, it may be more that um, the situations that they lived in didn't accommodate bicycling very well. So it wasn't viewed as a very realistic option. Um, so how do those factors play out in comfort ratings? Um, so these uh, bars show the percent of respondents in each group that would indicated they would feel comfortable riding through the different kinds of intersections. Um, the darker bar is for no interaction and the lighter bar is for situations when there is an interaction. And I should say the bike signal, um, in fact, uh, is, you know, there's no expected interaction. So that's just, um, you know, that's when they have their own phase. Uh, so on the left, the, the bike incline group tended to have higher uh, high, higher rate percentage of respondents indicating they would be comfortable with the various designs. Um, that's not surprising. Uh, the indifferent to bicycling and interested but concerned groups were similar in a lot of ways. Um, and you know, so the, the signalized intersection and the protected intersection were uh, comfortable for about two thirds of, of those respondents. Um, you do start to see a little bit more of a drop off for the interested but concerned for the maintain separation and bend in, and then particularly uh, for the lateral shift and mixing zone where under a third of respondents, regardless of whether there was an interaction or not, didn't feel comfortable um, riding in those situations. We also noted here that um, the interested but concerned did appear to be more sensitive both to the design type, so that you know the different intersections, but also to the presence of an interaction with a vehicle or not. So particularly if you look at the maintain separation and bend in, the drop off is pretty significant um, between whether there's an interaction with a car or not. Um, so it kind of, you know, it, it reinforces the idea that, you know, this is a group that is is going to be more responsive to design and, uh, and is, you know, you're gonna have to uh, be a little bit, if you're designing for those uh, for those people, 
be thinking more about what's going to accommodate their comfort. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Chris, uh, and he's going to go through some of the simulation and, uh, and other factors. All right, thanks, Nathan. <clears throat> um, so that this, you know, one of the one of the challenges of doing this this research is that, you know, the selection of the different design treatments is in a way um, driven by the by the by the conditions and the geometry and the right turning volume, and so there isn't. And that coupled with the variety of the different designs is still not, there's still not a standard type of these designs um, sort of made us think twice about trying to get this information from, um, from observational uh, approaches. Um, we've tried that a lot in our, in our past research and we, we didn't necessarily get um, um, results that would help inform um, things as as uh, volumes change, and so we attempted to to do this this time um, with some micro simulation. We encountered some challenges. I don't think it's quite ready uh, for prime time yet, um, but I think we were able to make um, some usable results for this research. And so we did um, for these locations. We did um, do some calibration of the of the model um, of the vehicle turning speeds. We observed um, video and sampled bicycles and right turning vehicles and collected their speed data. Um, and so we used this to inform these models. Um, <clears throat> we built. Um, and I think what you see here is what you'd expect on the bend out of the protected intersection design, the speeds of both bicycles and right turning vehicles in that turning zone or that conflict area are, are, are lower um, than the, uh, the other type designs. Um, those are average speeds. Um, so here's, uh, we built three uh, micro simulation models. Um, we built one of a mixing zone of, a, of the bend out, the protected design, and the bend in design. We <clears throat> we varied the bicycle volumes from 25 to 200. We varied the right turning volumes from 50 to 250. Um, we ran 10 uh, calibrated runs of each of those volume combinations. Um, the signal timing um, is obviously a Another variable in this um, that we did not um, we did not vary um, across the across the parameters, so um, that's a limitation I think of the approach here. Um, but most importantly, I think we had a lot of issues in getting the interactions between bicycles and vehicles to sort of inter to sort of exist as they do in the field, and so we ended up having kind of uh, our, our end result was we were going to use uh, the Federal Highway Administration's uh, surrogate safety assessment model SSAM tool to extract um, surrogate measures of safety in terms of time to collision and post encroachment time and these other time dependent uh, collision measures from the simulated trajectories. Um, but our challenges were in that in trying to calibrate the model so that the interactions were realistic from a um, from a perspective of those vehicles sharing space um, it essentially sort of um, didn't produce usable surrogate safety measures um, basically showed um, very small uh, collision type um, um, outputs um, so <clears throat> they're conflicts that we've estimated here, but I, it's probably better to call them interactions. This is basically bikes and vehicles sharing the same space is what um, is what we ended up uh, um, uh, extracting. Um, um, so <clears throat> um, as an example for one of the designs, here's the right turning vehicle volume on the on the left side of the table and the bicycle volume on the on the top of the table and these are the average number of interactions or simulated conflicts from any one of those um, volume combinations and in the report we've got tables for all three of the different designs um, and then there are some graphics um, which is fairly intuitive um, the one on the left here 
Um, this is a uh, number of complex for bicycles on the y-axis and just a slice um, of that right turning vehicle volume of 100 vehicles per hour. Um, and then the x-axis is the right turning, uh, <coughs> um, the right, sorry, the it's held constant at the bicycle volume at 100 vehicles per hour. The x-axis is uh, shows the right turning vehicle volumes from 50 to 250. And so not surprisingly, as you would expect, as the right turning volume uh, increases, the number of expected interactions go up. Um, and it, it really was the right turning volume that was the driver um, and had more more influence on the number of expected uh, conflicts than the than the bicycle volume. We were able to extract one um, measure of the severity of those interactions from the simulation model. Um, this is called the average maximum speed. It's the it's the value, the maximum speed, and this is in meters per second on the y-axis of any of any of the vehicles, either the bike or the car. Um, that was involved in the extracted uh, conflict or trajectory. And so even though the bend out design has more ex predicted or expected number of uh, conflicts or interactions, the, ex the, the speed, the maximum speed of those interactions are lower than either the bend out or the mixing zone design. Um, <clears throat> so kind of getting close to sort of wrapping it up, um, how we put these two things together, um, uh, there's a formula, but but basically this is just a weighted average of the two comfort scores. So we had comfort scores um, and we did this, we presented this for the different uh, groupings that Nathan presented, uh, but we had comfort scores by whether there was a vehicle, uh, no vehicle interaction where the turn was visible or those comfort scores with a vehicle that was interacted. Um, we weighted that basically by the number of the, say for bicycle volume of 100, how many of those bicycles uh, interacted with the vehicle and how many of those bicycles didn't interact with the vehicle. So the comfort score is the final comfort score in our sort of guidance. Um, either the comfort score or the percent comfort is kind of a weighted interaction, um, a weighted uh, composite of these two scores. Um, so it's easier, I think, to maybe understand the or the just the percent comfortable is a sort of an easier way to one of the ways that you can look at it. We also have that sort of comfort score from one to five. So again, this table just shows how we how we did that calculation. So um, this is the percent of people reporting they were comfortable for the various different designs. Um, uh, the the comfort percent comfortable for the when the turn was visible or when there was an interaction. And then here we're just showing by those different right turning volumes. And you can see in the table, it's not terribly sensitive to the right turning volumes. Um, the number of conflicts for bikes is fairly constant and the, um, well, constant for the shear. Um, and so the weight doesn't, doesn't change very much. Um, and um, so it's, it's really sort of about um, kind of looking at the, the percent comfortable across the designs. And this is for that typology of sort of the interested but concerned. And you can <clears throat> use this guidance in terms of, you know, making a decision about how much, uh, how, what percent of that typology that you would want to feel comfortable in your different designs. And really kind of highlighting that the signal of the protected intersection is the only one that uh, has more than 50% of that typology being um, comfortable in that design. Of course, if you go to one of the other typologies that uh, Nathan presented, uh, the comforts, uh, those people are more comfortable sort of mixing with traffic. And so all these these change by those typologies. And so those tables are presented as well. Um, but this is where you would um, sort of combine the, the two results. Um, so just kind of wrapping up, because I see we're close here on 45 minutes, um, some of the limitations is that, you know, we really wanted to look, um, we did not, as I stated at the beginning, didn't look at the safety of these design options um, in terms of reported crashes or other measures. Um, we weren't really able to differentiate some of the aspects of the different designs, such as the length of the mix merge or the offsets for those bend in, bent out, which, which we know uh, are probably important or we know are important for both the safety and for the comfort and we have some clues um, 
but we don't, we weren't able to sort of, um, to really sort of tease that out. We ran lots of models. And as Nathan mentioned, the really, the only thing that came out as statistically significant controlling for all the other factors was that exposure distance. And of course, you know, we have the limitations that the results are based on the folk, on the people in the survey and all of the, the, the limitations we mentioned before, but it's also based on their perceptions of the designs that we presented, which while we tried to do a good job of sort of curating um, good designs to evaluate, um, the, the reactions are based on these particular designs in this, in these, in these contexts. And, you know, lastly, I think, you know, this uh, micro simulation is, is a, is, is promising, but it's not yet completely valid, validated um, to re really sort of rep in reality replicate these interactions. And then I uh, we, we caution on sort of taking anything from these estimated conflicts and extending it anything beyond the purpose of this research, which was to sort of give us an idea of what, uh, what how might we weight these comfort scores um, by the number of interactions. Um, so that that's a that's a clear limitation. So <clears throat> those conclusions, which I already alluded to, is that um, as you'd expect, that separation matters, um, and uh, for the reasons that we've we've stated before, um, protected intersections or bend out and bike signals were found to provide the best uh, comfort. That um, exposure distance, I think, um, is a is a is something to, to look at um, and shortening that exposure distance, maintaining that buffer or vertical separation as far as you can um, is, is a good design objective from, from a comfort perspective. Um, and similarly to a lot of other work, um, we found that the interested but concern is this group is much more sensitive to mixing with traffic. They're more responsive in their feelings of comfort. Um, and, um, but I think encouragingly, um, this bend out or protect the intersection or bike signal had sort of 70% of those folks in the sample um, feeling comfortable at the intersection. And I think the riding with children um, questions we asked provide some insights. Um, but they're limited to a single clip. We didn't have any interactions with turning vehicles. So some caution to be used with interpreting that. So uh, lastly, I think, you know, it'd be remiss if, if I didn't point you to these two other resources, which you're probably aware of, but NACTO's um, Don't Give Up at the Intersection, which is a much better uh, title than the title for our research, um, um, has some great guidance in there. And then the, the New York City, we, uh, cycling in a crossroads looked at a lot of these similar designs in much more detail in New York. They also did comfort surveys. They were an intercept survey. They looked at safety and conflicts. Um, and I would say that um, a lot of what's in their findings uh, overlap uh, or are consistent um, with what um, we observed in our research. So, um, with that, I just do want to acknowledge NITSI for funding the, the grant. This is a unique um, project that's a pooled fund type approach where um, cities and agencies pool their funds and NITSI matches it for the research um, and they tackle uh, topics of interest um, to um, cities and communities. And again, the project team. So with that, Brandon, um, we went a little bit over, um, we've got about 10 minutes for questions. Great, Chris. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, so we have a number of questions. We still have, um, a few moments. If you, if you have a question, you haven't submitted it to do so on the questions section of the, um, webinar, go to webinar portal. I think the one of the main themes of the questions that we're getting is the, the breakdown of survey participants that um, I, is going to be included in the report but wasn't part of the webinar. Um, so people are wondering, um, you know, about the the race and ethnicity, the um, female and male, and also the the children. And um, just sort of the, if you could maybe provide a little bit that's in going to be in the report. Yeah, no, Nathan, you wanna you wanna take that? 
Um, yeah, so I, I know uh, looking through some of the questions, one of the, and I, I've been trying to answer some of them as we go along. So um, take a look at that question tab in the um, in the webinar screen. I did see one that was looking at whether the uh, whether the cluster groups took into account um, gender, for example, and whether so somebody pointed out that the the higher percentage of women in the interested but concerned group, you know, maybe that accounts for some of the differences between um, between the groups. And I would just say, you know, we we did the cluster analysis without specifically we didn't take into account demographic factors when grouping the cyclists, uh, in part because we wanted to get it different types of cyclists, not different demographics of people. And so, um, you know, the it did pan out that there were more women in that group that maybe was interested, but more concerned about um, about traffic and other factors. Um, and so that that clustering was really not meant to, you know, be control. You know, we, we were not controlling for demographics in that. Um, in general, when we talk about some of the the differences in comfort and looking at and, and how we observe the difference in uh, you know, exposure distance as being significant um, in the models that we ran, we did uh, also find that race and gender were significant and um, we don't we in the survey data that we have we can't necessarily look too deeply into that to know what are the experiences and factors of the of those different demographic groups that contribute to those that sense of comfort um, but it was something that we observed um, we do have more data in the report on the riding uh, experiences of the different uh, participants so how many of them uh, well, and I think Chris alluded to this, you know, the, the percent that had a bike or that had biked in the past year. So we do have some information on those factors. And yes, yeah, so it's on the screen there. Um, so we had about, you know, a third, 36% 20, had not ridden a bike in the past five years. Um, that's for transportation. So it's, you know, a little bit different than uh, it's not just looking at maybe somebody had rides only on a trail. Um, so we did have a mix of people there, but um, I, I hope that gets to some of the questions about the participants. I know there is a lot more in the report, and I don't know if Chris, you want to add anything to that. No, that's a good summary. Great. So we also have, um, you know, the a general sort of questions about how this is uh, focused on the right turns and uh, people people's comfort level, I'm sure, with getting on a bike isn't just about um, the right turn. Was that something that came came through in the surveys? Um, <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I guess, I mean, you know, most of the, you know, the interactions that um, are, well, you know, when we looked at, you know, what are the different parameters that folks are sort of you know, the designers are thinking about when they're trying to decide between these different designs is it's primarily driven by sort of the, the right turning volume. So it's more, you know, it's more often that you're able to sort of control, um, you know, the left turning movement. Um, um, but yeah, I mean, it was, an, it was, a, it was a focus um, to really look at that variable about the you know the right turning so we had we had met with some of the the panel and um, um, NACTO's uh, cities for cycling um, and this question about what right turning volume should I think about moving up um, maybe from a mixing zone to some higher levels of protection and so that's why we focused on the on the right turn um, we because that seemed to be the critical uh, variable um, that folks were asking um, to understand um, in terms of conflicts and um, and comfort. Okay, um, so we have time for probably one more question. There's obviously uh, the survey focuses on the bikes, bike, uh, the bikers. Um, what, what about pedestrians and uh, motorists and, and how uh, uh, sort of um, this whole uh, 
in built uh, environment is affected by that? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you know, um, again, it's kind of a question of scope. Um, we did explore um, at least the motorist perception of these different um, early of early designs of these different options. Many of them, not the bend out, um, but mixing zones um, and traffic signals um, and our prior NITSI report on lessons from the green lane um, where we surveyed drivers who had gone through these uh, facility types um, but we didn't we didn't do that for this for this work um, and so that is a I mean that is a that is another gap um, on how do drivers perceive these uh, different designs um, again and when we sort of scoped um, you know, these are really being built um, to create uh, low stress networks in cities and so that um, the comfort of people on bicycles um, seem to be the, the at least the first question to answer so um, and uh, that's so that's where we focus the work okay um there is there is a good question about the the participants who are surveyed and their understanding of the protected intersection designs. Um, so, did they have questions um, for the surveyors um, about what they were looking at? Um, Nathan can probably. Yeah, Nathan can probably answer that. But I mean, these the folks were they were sitting in a room watching those clips. I'm sorry the clips didn't get the play. Um, the final report has links to all the YouTubes, but they they saw the clips basically as they were if they were riding a bicycle. Um, and so um, they didn't have to make any decisions about you know how to go through this intersection because the um, Nathan and I were riding through the intersections for them. They were just looking at the surroundings and the and the interaction with vehicles. So I don't know, Nathan, I, did you get any questions um, in, uh, the, in the rooms? So two things. No, we, we actually got very few questions about that. Um, so I, you know, I can't say that many people were trying to figure out how, or at least engaging us in, in how, how they would do that. Um, the other thing is that the, the links that, uh, Chris, uh, that Chris tried to show the clips for, and we had that failure, I have included those links in the chat. So if you want to try to look at those, they are there. Okay, great. Okay, so we're going to wrap up the webinar. Um, I'd like to thank you both, Chris and Nathan. Um, we're going to have to follow up with uh, some answers to a lot of these questions. Um, Nathan's been doing a good job answering as many as he's been able to, but we will um, provide answers um, to your questions. Um, so yeah, uh, thank you all for attending and please uh, check out our upcoming events. Okay, thank you.